Hopefully that doesn't monetize the video right out of the gate. But it seems like this Fannie Willis case is more about Fannie getting off than we initially realized, if you know what I mean. I can't say that this is an unbelievable ruling, but, you know, it just furthers most people's belief that there's no justice. I mean, that's, well, let's think about this a little bit, because I know people have had some time to uh, maybe listen to some commentary on this, give it some thought on their own. A pile driver happening here. New York City construction. It's very warm today. It's supposed to go up to almost 70. It might even be there. It was raining a bit before, so kind of crazy weather. But this Fannie Willis not disqualified. So what do we make of that? <clears throat> well, I've watched a bit of commentary on this. I think it's important to listen to uh, opinions maybe that you agree with and opinions that you disagree with. Oh, we got beautiful cherry blossoms in bloom. Spring is springing, even here in filthy New York City. Now there's a crazy, there's this new style of Cadillac that looks like a station wagon and they have some $300,000 electric one. Who the hell would pay $300,000 for a Cadillac station wagon? I don't know, but Fannie Willis. And by the way, Hopefully the video is still playing right now. I anticipate George's psychopath wife swapping brother is gonna to attempt to strike the video for what I think is an extremely creative and interesting thumbnail. Uh, we've got Fanny here, and I did look up the YouTube rules before doing this because obviously, you know, you're not allowed to sexualize people. You're not allowed to target people. But there are exceptions. They said that if they're not, not to sexualizing people, but they said that you can show people in underwear and bikinis and even naked if it's not for, what did they say? Something like, you know, purient, sexual, like you can't make fake porn with people. But they did say specifically if the person was in a government position or a powerful individual, that they're an exception. So anyway, I, he's still going to probably try to get the video struck. So I highly recommend that we dispense with YouTube and people should subscribe on odyssey.com slash at crowdsource the truth. It's totally free to subscribe to Odyssey. You can watch all the same videos that go out on YouTube <clears throat> without the hassle of YouTube, you know, censoring and telling us what we can talk about and what we can't. And then the other thing is you can also become a sponsor on Odyssey. And uh, then you're going to get access to all of the great sponsor exclusive content that you can also get on Substack. Uh, well, crowdsourcethetruth.substack.com. It's a little confusing to control all of this at once while I'm walking. Uh, yeah, but anyway, you can also subscribe on subscribestar.com slash crowdsource the truth and patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth. I guess I didn't need this jacket. It might get a little bit warm, but Fannie Willis. So first I was listening to Jonathan Turley, who I like. I like his opinions. Now here's an electric Cadillac. Oh wait, it, wow, is this the, holy crap. Is this the crazy $300,000 electric Cadillac? It is, isn't it? No, I don't know. Interesting. Now, I think the crazy, crazy one is maybe not out yet, but there's an electric Cadillac. I don't know, that looks like crap to me. I wouldn't get that. But I was listening to Jonathan Turley, and uh, obviously he's a Democrat, he says that all the time, but he does give, uh, I think, very impartial legal analysis and he's a smart experienced lawyer somebody was telling me that he represented area 51 or some people who worked at area 51 i don't know anything about that i'd like to know more about that kevin ship said that he was represented by jonathan turley so clearly turley has a uh, 
Well, and Kevin Shipp even said that he was able to do that because he has a security clearance. So when you're dealing with legal cases that involve top secret stuff, national security and whatever, you need a lawyer who can look at that. So there's a lot of questions about how that process actually works because there's reason to believe that some of my civil cases are essentially being treated like national security cases and information is being covered and blocked and whatever. But see, it's difficult for me to evaluate this stuff because I don't really have a very good frame of reference in court. I'm not an attorney. Uh, if I were, somebody my age would have like 30 years of experience, 25, 30 years of litigating and dealing with different judges and knowing all kinds of lawyers. I don't know any of that stuff. So nobody should take any legal advice from me, but if you're a layperson like me trying to make heads or tails of this Fannie Willis situation, maybe I have some interesting insights that you might enjoy. But in addition to watching lawyers that I like and agree with frequently, like Jonathan Turley, that guy Phil Holloway, he appears with uh, Megan Kelly. She's also a lawyer, and I think she sometimes has very good, she's smart, I think. She has good legal insights. But Phil Holloway is really good on this case because he is an attorney in Cobb County, even knows um, Ashley Merchant and some of the other attorneys who are involved. I think he knows the judge or has, you know, aware of the judge. And he definitely knows a lot about the rules. Porsche Taycan, that's that thing that they were having all kinds of, uh, you know, the British, whatever that law was, <laughs> putting them all on lease. And the thing is having all kinds of all kinds of problems where the leases are up now because it's been out for three years or whatever. But uh, yeah, I, so I was watching Phil and he was very disappointed. See, the other thing that I sometimes notice about these very experienced, very straight arrow kind of lawyers, like Phil Holloway seems to me like a serious guy. You know, he's a lawyer. He's not like Stephen Biss or some moron who's messing around and these kind of serious lawyers I, they, I think they kind of have a like a difficult time believing that this sort of stuff can happen in the extreme ways that it is this is an electric Hyundai I see a lot of electric cars coming around um, so they were sort of surprised and disappointed that Scott McAfee, the judge, did not disqualify Fanny. So, I mean, I guess a lot of people figured that would happen simply because, you know, uh, people expect the worst. People expect nothing to happen. See, those guys didn't want to be on camera. They turned around when I started walking this way, but they don't realize what direction the camera is facing. Why are there all these people around who don't want to be on camera? Are they planning to shoot somebody on the subway? I hope not. That was crazy. But McAfee didn't disqualify her, and there's all these different kind of like moving parts to this scenario, because in Georgia State Court, maybe in all state courts, the judges are elected, right? So they run and they put little signs in people's lawn and stuff like that. And probably nobody knows who the hell any of these judges are. And so anything like this that happens that brings attention to the judge or the campaign or his competition or whatever, you know, it's going to affect the election. Here's the Space Invaders thing. And there's space. But it's, I mean, you know, it's this question. Should judges be appointed? Should judges be elected? It always seems like it's a problem, no matter which way it goes. Because if they're appointed, well, you know, now we've got Barack Obama. Wow, look at this. Appointing Judge Caproni or whatever. Isn't that cool? It's like a, like a rock garden art gallery here. The Jim Kemper Fine Art. So you thought this was just a construction site. It's fine art. And they're like. Oh. 
So McAfee didn't dismiss her, and you got to consider, was that a political decision? Does he feel like Fannie Willis is so politically powerful in Fulton County that if he kicked her out, he'd lose his job? Maybe. See, in my experience, though, the, well, most of my judges have just straight gone against me no matter what I've done. But it seems like judges always want to compromise stuff down to nobody being happy about it. And what I've observed is that they generally, they don't want their decisions to be overturned on appeal. Because like if you're one of these judges who every decision you ever make gets overturned on appeal, then it sort of, you know, makes you look like an idiot. You're making all the wrong decisions that other judges overturn. So they're cautious about not kind of they don't want to do something that's completely one way or the other. And I think that that is what this guy was doing. It was where we got a 360 video of the high line being made. Uh, so at first I was pretty annoyed that he didn't just kick out Fanny. But he gave her this like little riddle almost, right? He said either she has to get rid of Nathan Wade and she can stay or she has to go. But how would that work if Nathan Wade is a, I'm not sure I understand that. If Nathan Wade is just a, an attorney in private practice who they hired to be a special gigolo, I mean, a special prosecutor, how can he continue to prosecute a case if he's, I don't understand how that would work. He's just a lawyer, he's not the county. So anyway, it seems like they're gonna kick him out and then try to continue it, but I mean, how does he ignore that Fanny lied? Um, all the stuff with the money. He was just talking about the appearance of a conflict of interest. But what about lying? What about, I mean, that's a crime, right? When you go in there and raise your right hand and say you swear to not lie, and then you lie, that's perjury. So this has also come up before, like when I've been in court, Twice this happened. Once with Caproni, when they had that show cause hearing where they accused me of releasing the email address, I explained to her that my attorney, who had been, you know, he had withdrawn at that time, so the judge compelled me to testify pro se, even though. I wasn't even in the case. I was just sort of dragged in there for this show cause hearing. And I explained to her that my attorney had said that this email address was in the public domain because a, an attorney for the plaintiff had mentioned it during a deposition. That's what I said under oath. And that's what I remembered. Because at that time in 2021 or two, when was that, 2022, I didn't know the difference between a deposition and a hearing. I just thought a deposition was talking about something under oath. But whatever, that's the kind of small mistake that you can make when you're not a lawyer that can screw you up. And the judge loved that. She seized on that because under oath, I had said it was in a deposition. And she said, oh, well, the contents of a deposition are still confidential, so you still broke the thing. And I lost and was sanctioned at that hearing. And then I went home and checked the transcript and I said, oh, wait a minute. It wasn't a deposition. It was a public hearing. Here it is on the docket, printed in the transcript. You go look at it right now. If I mention it, I get, um, I get, you know, contempt of court. It's too hot. I got to take this jacket off. Let's see if I can do this. How am I going to? keep this on my wrist and get the jacket off. Let's see if we can do this. I don't think I can. This is going to be weird. Never tried this before, but let's try. So when I got home, I told her, hey, wait a minute. I've just realized it wasn't a deposition. It was a public hearing. And so when I published the email address, it was already in the public domain 
and I did not violate the stipulated order of protection. But wow. what Judge Caproni did was, she said, oh no, you can't change your testimony because you're not a party to this case. And until this fake corporation that George's brother invented so we could jam you up here and make you think your company was getting sued because the name is almost identical and you got tricked, Jason can't say anything until he gets another lawyer. That's basically what Caproni said. Even though I was trying to correct my pro se testimony within less than 24 hours of having given it, which they usually do. Like, if you write a thing that says, hey, I said X, Y, and Z yesterday because I didn't have a lawyer and I don't know the difference between a deposition and a hearing, and I checked the transcript and now I realize I remembered what happened incorrectly when I was asked and I want to modify my statement, they'll usually let you do that. But you see, the fact is, me being sanctioned or not turned on that one thing and the judge obviously knew that and prevented me from being able to do it. Not because she was serving justice, because she wanted me to be sanctioned. So that's a bit of a different kind of scenario. I can't say that Scott McAfee has any kind of uh, motive to do something bad to the defendant, which was the case in Natas v. MSD, I allege. But I think he's trying to kind of cover his ass, where people who like Fannie Willis will say, oh, good. See, that guy, Scott McAfee, he's a good judge. He, he, you know, he hates Trump, and he let Fannie Willis get off. Seems like everybody in Fulton County is trying to help Fannie Willis get off. But I guess he's preserved the Fannie Willis, you know, voter contingency as far as keeping his job goes. And in his defense, for people who want to be like, oh, that damn Scott McAfee screwed Trump, I don't know. I mean, this obviously, it's not like, not like Fannie is winning. And I think she's got a pretty big up, she's a wounded animal at this point. So everybody knows that she lied. How, how could she have any credibility there? And by the way, the judge still has to decide whether he's going to decide in her favor or not. So she's in a very, very bad position in the case. Now, the other thing that Phil Holloway was talking about, and this is a pretty confusing subject. People were asking, well, can you appeal just this fact that he's letting Fannie stay there? And at first, Phil Holloway said, maybe. So this is very confusing. There's something, I am not a lawyer, remember. This is something I looked up on the internet and was confused by, and now I'm sharing with all of you. There's something called an interlocutory appeal which is an appeal to an order that is a non-final order, but then there's all kinds of orders that you can't do that to. So it's, I have no idea really how you can figure out when you can or cannot use that because this came up in the Steele v. Goodman case. Um, let me see if I can remember what it was that I was appealing. Biss did something like absolutely outrageous. Oh yeah, he was communicating with the court and filed something where it made no sense. And I was like, Biss, you must have had some communication with the court. And he said, yeah, they sent me an email. I said, well, what are you doing with ex parte communications with the court? Send me that email. And he refused. And then ultimately in some motion, he had copied the text of the email, but I wanted to see the header, what time it was sent, who else might have gotten it, who sent it to him. It was very, very weird. But anyway, I, uh, the judge made some decision that I thought was outrageous. And so I was like, I was aware of this interlocutory appeal, but I didn't know exactly what it was. So I looked it up. I mean, I got limited resources, right? I'm looking at the Cornell Law Library. I shouldn't say that. It's, it's actually virtually unlimited resources. I guess this is some Diane von Furstenberg sale or something. But anyway, I'm looking at the Cornell Law Library and LexisNexis and stuff like that. But 
and videos. I've actually tapped into a rich vein of law school just lectures. I don't know why anybody would go to law school. Any, almost any topic I'm trying to find out about, you can pretty much find some law school, law professor has a lecture that's, I mean, it's just as if you were sitting there in class. So anyway, I thought I understood what to do with this interlocutory appeal, and I filed one, and the judge in the Robert David Steele case, he said something about, a very complicated language about how this is not an appealable order, but nevertheless, the court has lost jurisdiction or whatever, and then it was hanging out in the appellate court, which is, I, I guess, the fourth circuit, I think, for Virginia. And they sort of looked at it and were like, no, and sent it back. But, I mean, by remarkable luck in that case, during the time that the, uh, that the fourth circuit was looking at it, Biss had a stroke. Obviously, I had no way of knowing that was going to happen, and it wasn't my intention to, you know, file a defective uh, appeal and, and just to waste time. I, I disagreed with the judge's order and thought that it was unfair and not based on the facts and the evidence. But it did extend the amount of time required to deal with the case, and in that time, Biss had a stroke. Then. Robert David Steele's wife couldn't find a, or chose not to, I don't know, she didn't get another attorney, so the thing ended in my favor. That was pretty lucky, but it seems to have inspired a vexatious douchebag who I speak about pretty often to try and do the same thing. However, in his case, it seems obvious that he's doing it to waste time. And I have to imagine a judge would be pissed off by that. But anyway, back to the interlocutory appeal idea. So Phil first said, maybe, which, I mean, obviously he was just saying this on a YouTube video, so I couldn't ask him why maybe, but it just, it leads me to believe that this is like an area, there's certain things where you just never know what's gonna happen, you know? The judge can kind of do whatever they want almost all the time, so. I don't know if there's going to be an interlocutory appeal of Judge McAfee's decision to leave Fannie Willis in place or not, but that's one thing that could happen. But I mean, the important thing to remember is, you know, Fannie, when she said, I'm not on trial, they're on trial, I think she had that kind of wrong. And now we see so much of this trial was taken up with her malfeasance. It's amazing what didn't, what didn't happen to her. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about is, yeah, I mean, why did Scott McAfee do this? He certainly could have easily disqualified her. You know, he avoided talking about certain things. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any mention of the perjury under oath, which I, I mean, honestly, that should be taken much more seriously. So right, so back to Judge Caproni, when I was on the stand, I explained to her that my lawyer told me that this guy, Sam Eichner, had blurted out this email address and that it was in the public domain. And Caproni said, well, I don't believe you. And I said, what are you talking about? You don't believe me. So you're saying I'm lying, then why aren't you charging me with perjury? And it was just like, you know, I have a tendency to kind of sometimes ask people questions that when I get to the final question, they just don't answer it because I'm drilling into what the answer would be and they don't want to give it. So that's what happened there. She just stopped answering. And I never got a logical explanation of how you can tell me that you don't believe what I'm saying, which implies that I'm lying, but not find me in contempt of court for committing perjury. By the way, perjury is a crime. I think I even said to her, isn't it a crime to come up here and lie? I mean, I'm not lying. That would be crazy. And I, she just had nothing to say. And that was the first time that happened to me. The second time that happened to me was in court with somebody who, if I mention the name, I'll be in contempt of court. Ivan Raiklin mentioned the name. He knew it would put me in contempt of court. Why did he do that? He's a lawyer. He was with me in court. 
when this order was given. Seemed like he was deliberately trying to defy it to get me in trouble, and it seems like he's very close to Michael Flynn, so I don't know what would have motivated him to do that, but it certainly wasn't my best interest. So, yeah, they don't care about Fanny perjuring herself. And again, this could be due to her substantial political power in Fulton County. I don't know. I think it might be due to something else. Wasn't she pressuring Terrence Bradley, saying, hey, don't say anything, they're on to us. She's paying out 600 grand to Nathan Wade. I mean, she really is like a mafia boss. And I, I just wonder if it's something more than just political influence. And so uh, people maybe have seen on Twitter, if you're following me on Twitter, at JG underscore CSTT, I published a couple of pictures of an individual who appears to be Fannie Willis's mother. Let's look at this. So this is, what is her name again? Sherry Dalton. She's got so many aliases here. Sherry Laverne Dalton. She certainly looks a bit like Fanny, right? The shape of her face, the cheekbones, the nose. And there we see a picture of her standing. I've done a comparison of their bodies side by side. They have the same kind of body type. And look at this, look at all these aliases she's using. So anyway, she is, um, She's wanted by the FBI, and then somebody sent me this picture from a high school yearbook, Sherry Dotson, Cheryl Dotson. I think that's her. Now look, any of this could be incorrect. If somebody has evidence that disproves it, I don't know, is this the same woman in high school? We don't really know. But then I found this picture of Sherry Dotson, who looks a hell of a lot like Fanny, hanging out with Fanny's dad, and it looks to me like she's pregnant. He's so happy, he's got his hand on her stomach. She's got her hand on the stomach. Looks like she's pregnant. And this is from some University of California photo archive, which I thought I saw the date on here the first time I went, but there is no date, which I found very weird. This is from like a whole photo collection of, um, what was the guy's name? Bradley, Mayor Bradley. And this, 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 that's the collection, and then this is the photographer here, Guy Crowder. And look at this, every other photograph that Crowder takes has the date. He's kind of like a civil rights photograph photographer, and he's in Los Angeles in the 70s and the 80s, and he's, you know, Bradley was the mayor, so that was obviously a big deal. He was black, and he's got a lot of stuff with lawyers and politicians, and civil rights activist. Here's Johnny Cochran, right? But it's interesting, they all have the date. I mean, if you have an online photo archive, don't you want the date? Isn't it incredibly conspicuous to have a picture of somebody who looks just like Fannie Willis hanging out with Fannie Willis's dad? And I could, I could have sworn when I looked at it a week or two ago, it said 1971, which seems like Right around when Fannie Willis would have been born, she looks like she's about my age, 51, 52, 50, something like that. So her mother being pregnant in 1971, that would make a lot of sense. I've been talking about it on Twitter. It's certainly possible if you are Fannie Willis, you just search Fannie Willis for your own name and find who's talking about you and say, hey, get that date off of that incredibly damning piece of evidence with that woman who looks almost exactly like me, who's hanging out with my dad pregnant during the very same year I was born. So people say to me, are you sure that's Fannie Willis? And the answer is no, I'm not sure. And they say, well, I want proof. It's like, okay. But there's a lot of different standards for proof and I'm just in charge of locating evidence. Somebody else is to determine if this preponderance of evidence or overwhelming amount of evidence is in fact proof. I just think it's Pretty darn interesting, looks a hell of a lot like Fanny. Let's keep looking at this. Uh, this woman is dead apparently, according to the Washington Post. This is from five years ago, Nahanda Obioden. 
which definitely was one of the aliases. It's the first one they have listed here. Look at all those aliases. Maybe the FBI doesn't even know all of the aliases, but there, there's a lot of people on Twitter saying, oh, the FBI is offering a, war, a reward, but she died. And I mean, how do we know she died? She's in Cuba, allegedly. This is the Washington Post. Do we think the Washington Post would possibly lie? She was involved in that 1981 Brinks car robbery in Westchester County that Chesa Boudin's parents were involved in. They went to jail for that because uh, I think a police officer and a bank guard were killed. So she, she was there with the uh, BLA as the Black Liberation Army. This is all, see, here she's hanging out with the Weather Underground. So the Black Panthers, the Black Liberation Army, the Weather Underground, Republic of New Africa, all of that stuff was like radical 60s and 70s domestic terrorists bombing things and you know robbing banks and killing people and whatever and this is crazy so by all accounts she evaded capture by crisscrossing the country before making her way to cuba and then she's hanging out there with mutulu shakur the stepfather of tupac and he was arrested in 1986. so now i had heard about joanne chesimir being asada shakur and people said that she was Tupac's mother, but then the evidence did not seem to support that. I had not heard about this guy who was supposedly his stepfather before this morning. So I don't know, maybe, who knows what's going on. But how is Tupac connected to all of these legacy weather underground people who escaped to Cuba? And what's up with, remember that joke that uh, Obama made that joke at the White House Correspondents' Dinner saying that, oh, you know, Trump gave up on the birth certificate, so now he can spend time worrying about the moon landing and who shot Biggie and Tupac. Isn't that weird? It just, it's stuck in my mind because it was the same tactic used by Dershowitz when that scumbag Patrick Beck David stole my material and did a video with Robert Kennedy Jr. and Dershowitz about that time I provoked Dershowitz to make the stupid comment that he thought the government could force you to get injected. During that interview, Dersh made sure to mention that Sirhan Sirhan had killed Robert Kennedy's father. I found it incredibly distasteful to bring up the murder of somebody's father in the middle of a conversation that's not about that but it was reinforcing to people who maybe didn't know that, this idea that Sirhan Sirhan had shot Robert Kennedy. And it's weird. You know, I think, I don't remember offhand right now, but I've, since I started noticing this, I've noticed other similarly situated scumbags doing similar things, like constantly reiterating the mainstream topic, whether it's about 9-11, JFK assassination, moon landing, Tupac and Biggie, whatever it is. But if people didn't see the video that we did earlier, oh! Sam Ash, closing. Very bad. Obviously, I don't play musical instruments, but those guys sell a lot of digital sound equipment, and I do shop there. I have bought a lot of things there, cables, USB interfaces, yeah, M audio you see over there. That's just bad. That location only. So Sam Ash is closing. Not good. And also, I used to go there a lot because 21st Century 3D was right next door to the New Yorker Hotel. That's, well, I was about to talk about Shepard, the New York Hotel, New Yorker Hotel. That is where Tesla, Nikola Tesla, lived toward the end of his life and he died in there and he had a plan to put something on the top of that building that was supposed to broadcast electricity but that's another topic for another show we were talking with Shepard on I guess Tuesday people can still see that episode on odyssey.com slash at crowdsource the truth crowdsource the truth dot substack dot com and Subscribestar.com and Patreon.com 
slash crowdsource the truth. We were talking about this uh, Lil Rod, Rodney Jones lawsuit versus P. Diddy, where, you know, all this stuff with Tupac and Biggie comes in. Shepard knows a lot more about that. But, you know, Tupac getting shot. Did that guy say something to me? I didn't say anything to him. Yeah, I mean, now that everybody's like walking around shooting people, saying anything to anybody is not a good idea. I never noticed before this movie theater address is 312, which is a subtle 33. <laughs> I guess you could find that anywhere. Anyway, so yeah, what the hell is going on with Tupac and all these people with the last name Shakur? What the hell is going on there in Cuba? And what is the source of Fannie Willis's political influence, let's call it? Here's a stupid idiot on a bicycle. All these people. So, I mean, even tourists see people doing that. Even well-meaning people see this and think, oh, riding on the sidewalk, that must be the thing to do. Well, so what happened to this guy? I don't think we know yet. There was an altercation on the subway yesterday where some dude, there was a fight going on, and, and there was a 32-year-old guy and a 36-year-old guy. 36-year-old guy takes out a gun. 32-year-old guy takes the gun from him and shoots him in the head with it. And by the way, the guy with the gun, of course, has been to jail multiple times, let out. I'm not saying you can't let people out of jail, but this is the typical story that we're hearing is that just inadequate law enforcement, inadequate treatment by the courts. What a wreck this is over here. You know, they're so busy getting Fannie Willis off that they just don't have time to I mean, look at how jammed and crowded this sidewalk is, and this asshole thinks it's a great idea to ride a bicycle through all this mess. Well, he also thinks it's a great idea to stab or shoot. What the, I mean, look at this. Oh, this is a garage, I guess. So there we go. I mean, you know, Fannie Willis is still quite far from winning this case against Trump. Oh, right. And so the whole watching lawyers that I like and don't like, it's very informative. I highly recommend it. The two lawyers that I, well, three actually, who I follow, who I really don't like, uh, are uh, Norm Eisen, Andrew Weissman, and Lawrence Tribe, and Dershowitz. Because basically, Dershowitz less so. Dershowitz is on some other track. Dershowitz seems to be very, very involved in higher level stuff having to do with Israel and Epstein. And, you know, he freaked out that that whole thing with Patrick Bet David and Robert Kennedy Jr. And Dershowitz, I think, was put together to try to cover over some of the stuff that I got Dershowitz to talk about. They really, really wanted everybody to focus on his statements about the forced vaccination and not the stuff that he said about Bill Clinton and Linda Rothschild and Epstein and all of that. Starting the, what was it, the Clinton Global Initiative. That was all the stuff I think Dershowitz was trying to cover up. But uh, Lawrence Tribe, Norm Eisen, and Andrew Weissman, I think, are very, very much affiliated with the Lawfare Institute and planning and executing all these lawfare assaults, including the stuff against Trump and Fannie Willis, because they're just constantly on MSNBC and all these other stupid channels. And this morning, Andrew Weissman looked super nervous, irritated, agitated, and he was saying that he thinks Fannie Willis should recuse herself, which I couldn't understand why he would think that. I agree, she should have done that in the beginning. She should have said, oh, wait a minute, I'm having sex with the prosecutor and this whole thing is a sham. I better recuse myself. But instead she said, no, no, you're on trial, not me. 
So it's weird that I think that Weissman saying that is a pretty strong indicator that the plan is not going well. And it looked like, I don't know, maybe her getting into lots and lots of trouble would reveal more of their plan. And perhaps he's thinking if she just like recuses herself and gets the hell out of there, they can minimize the damage and rely on some of these other cases to try to get Trump. That's what he said. I haven't seen what Lawrence Tribe has to say about this. Um, I did see Dershowitz last night talking to uh, Megyn Kelly. And Dershowitz was basically saying that he thinks that Fanny's got to go. So he didn't seem like he was on team Weissman. And remember, Andrew Weissman is very closely associated with Valerie Caproni. In his book, Where Law Ends, he said Valerie Caproni was his mentor. And it's recorded that uh, she was the head of the organized crime division of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York when Weissman was in there. He was an assistant U.S. attorney, and so was she, and she was the head of the organized crime division. Here's a new fancy cannabis place. I mean, at least they have a security guard. That makes sense. I can't imagine. This guy looks like he would beat the shit out of anybody. <laughs> Don't mess with that. But, um, yeah, so Dershowitz seems to be dealing with other things. He was pissed off that Chuck Schumer was telling Israel who to vote for. I mean, isn't that crazy? Whatever you think about Israel, why is Chuck Schumer telling other countries what they need to do with their elections. They're all so upset about countries doing that to us. Why doesn't he shut up and mind his own business? Chuck Schumer is an asshole. So is Dersh. But I mean, look, even if you don't like somebody, you can evaluate what they're saying. And I mean, Dershowitz certainly has a lot of experience. He's so pretentious, though, and he's like singing with Megyn Kelly on there. He was acting weird. I, I, I mean, I find Megyn Kelly very attractive, so maybe Dershowitz was uh, losing his cool over that. Now, this is new, a Target right here. Absolutely absurd. I mean, this is the... Uh... Hmm. Sephora, was that always there? Anyway, enough of that. But it seems to me that Weissman is nervous. And, um, yeah, I think Scott McAfee was kind of trying to cover his ass from all directions so that Fannie Willis fans will still vote for him. And also he, I mean, didn't really put Trump in a terrible position. I mean, he did knock out six of the charges. And I, by the way, all of the really high-level lawyers who are looking at this are saying things like they don't understand why some of these decisions were made. Certainly, they don't agree with a lot of the decisions. And a lot of them are saying they want to read the thing again. So I have a feeling that there's going to be lots and lots of stuff in between, you know, reading in between the lines. And it's going to take smart lawyers who know the law, know the case, maybe know these people and the other circumstances that they're considering to figure out why. Maybe we'll never figure out why McAfee made this decision. Look at how out of business that side of the street is. not a hole in the wall with Briny Bird. And that's Capital One Bank? I mean, why do we need a bank there? This is a retail area. That's the thing that was Victoria's Secret over there on the corner. And then this whole so that's the Harry Potter Museum. Do they, don't they still have that one on Fifth Avenue? How many Harry Potter museums do you need? And then all these stores are out. GameStop was over there. That, that's not surprising that that's out. You can get all your games on the internet now. But this is retail carnage here in New York City. This is the Manhattan Mall I'm standing right outside. So this is, you know, a big retail area. And all of this stuff is going out of business while people sell, you know, counterfeit goods and stolen whatever they're selling. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention the other reason why I, I wanted to come out uh, is because John Cullen is running a fever. Hopefully not chicken flu. 
but he's not feeling well, so we're not going to have the show tonight. And I wanted to update everybody on Fanny Willis and let them know uh, about that. Let me think if there's anything else that I wanted to bring up. Pretty much that was it for the videos, the pre-recorded yeah. videos. But um, I've been very busy on counter-lawfare stuff, and I hope to have a new counter-lawfare episode soon. Yeah, but I don't know. This is... We need this to percolate. I think by Monday we'll have a better feeling for what this ruling is going to ultimately mean for Fannie Willis and for President Trump. I mean, look, it's certainly not bad for Trump. Uh, maybe we would have liked a more comprehensive ruling for McAfee that would have knocked Fannie out of the box, but I don't know. I think this is okay because it's certainly when the case is done, if Trump doesn't like the ruling, he can certainly appeal the final order. And all of this stuff, you know, that will be up for discussion, debate, whatever, during the appeal. So I think Trump is in a pretty good position. And by the way, if you look at the totality of all of this, yeah, sure, they're charging Trump 500 million and all this. Not good, obviously, he's embroiled in lawfare. It's not exactly a birthday party, but sort of like me, their cases aren't going that well, you know? Biss and, uh, or well, uh, what is his name? Uh, Robert David Steele dies, Biss has a stroke. Uh, Judge Caproni's ruling is uh, up for appeal at the Second Circuit, and you know, she didn't like that 60B4 motion that said that she's in a conspiracy with the plaintiffs and helped Adam Sharp install the FBI into Twitter. She didn't say that's scurrilous and false and Goodman is in contempt of court for attempting to undermine the authority of the court with scandalous lies. She could have done that. That was within the scope of her stuff that she could do, you know. Her discretion. Why didn't she do that? I think I know. It's because the stuff is true. And I think she probably figured the Second Circuit isn't going to help me, which is pretty likely. Uh, it's going to take a long time before they ever look at it, and I could get hit by a bus or any number of things could happen. And I think she just... There's a number of things that happened towards the end of that Natas case with Judge Caproni that led me to believe that I had her kind of off balance. The last order that she put in was basically, it made no sense. And I wrote back saying, this doesn't make sense. I, I need clarity on this order because here's this over here, here's that over there, here's me doing exactly what you said, what are you talking about? And she didn't write back. So it just seemed like she was frazzled when she wrote that last memo endorsement and now my sanction from uh, Judge Caproni has expired. Remember, when she falsely determined that I had violated her order by revealing this email address that I did not reveal yeah, yeah. in violation of a uh, uh, stipulated order of protection, that was in place from, I think, February 22nd, 2022 until February 22nd, 2024. And she forced me in any case that I was in, whether I was the plaintiff or the defendant, to instruct the court that I had violated an order. So she's basically presenting me to any new judge as, hey, this guy's a scofflaw who violates orders. And the fact is, that's not what happened. So it's interesting to see the shitty way that fat bitch runs her court, where she injects lies about me immediately and then has George's psychopath brother spread that crap all around to uh, half a dozen different district courts. Because they want to deny me access to the court. They say, oh, no, no, you're not in our club. You don't have a bar license. You're not an attorney. If you had a bar license and I was a judge, I could hold that over your head and threaten your livelihood and force you to comply with what I want. 
without even saying anything. There would be the subtle implication that you're going to lose your ability to practice if you do X, Y, or Z. And I think what they've observed is, as I learn more about the law and how I can access it, I'm willing to do things within the context of the law that most attorneys would not do. File motions against judges and things that lawyers would say, are you nuts? Because the judge is going to get pissed off and then when you come in here, like let's say it was a lawyer filing this stuff for me and then tomorrow he's got to go in front of Caproni with some other client, they'd be like, oh, Mr. Goodman, you again. Yeah, your client's losing here, or at least you'd be concerned about that. You don't want a judge to hate you. I, it's, it's, I think it's beyond debate that these judges are not impartial. And that's really the problem that we need to address. I don't know, I mean, it seems like whenever you uh, look at any of these options, there's something about them that isn't good. And you know, Larry Clayman was a very good sounding board and uh, source of advice for this kind of stuff because he's a very experienced attorney and he's also very experienced with corruption in the justice system, being the victim of it. You know, he was in the Department of Justice and he saw that it was corrupt and he's been subject to lawfare from George's brother and other people, even if he doesn't realize it, and sanctions from the bar. I mean, it's, it just seems to me there's a lot, you're never going to be able to make it perfect, but there's a lot of sort of extremely obvious problems. Like the judges need more oversight. I think maybe judges should all be appointed so that we can avoid this kind of, uh, you know, when there's an election and the judge is making some politically motivated decision, maybe appointing them would eliminate that, but then they were also saying that, like, you know, Brian Kemp can't do anything about Fanny because she's not appointed, she's elected. And so in, unless she's indicted for a crime, they can't remove her. So that's interesting and complicated. But what I'm thinking is if there was some way, like, maybe, let's just focus on federal judges for a minute. So if the federal judges are appointed, what if there was a process, like maybe if you could get 10,000 signatures or whatever the number is, that it would automatically trigger a review, not by the Second Circuit with all the judge's friends and all the people who are going to be subject to this review, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If you can present a case, there obviously would have to be rules about how this is done, but if you have legitimate evidence of judicial misconduct, that's windy. Holy cow. And you can get 10,000 signatures in support of your thing. That should just go to the Judiciary Committee in Congress and there should have to be a hearing. And that initial hearing, I don't know, there'd be a process where they'd review the evidence or at least it goes to Congress and they'd have to write back to you telling if there will or will not be a hearing and have a whole process of appealing that. If they say no, no hearing, they have to tell you why, and you have the ability to appeal it or whatever. But there should be a way that if there's a judge who for like 40 years has been violating the Constitution, violating people's rights, putting people in jail who shouldn't be there, letting people go who should be in jail, there should be a process by which the people can remove a judge. And that way, a judge, they shouldn't be fearful of making an unfavorable decision to a particular individual if it's based on the law and the facts, but they should be very fearful of doing anything along the lines of what Fanny is doing or uh, what Judge Caproni has consistently done, because they should know that if they get caught, they're gonna be in a hell of a lot of trouble, and they should also know that individual citizens would have the ability to initiate this kind of process. So this place keeps having illegal cannabis seized. Somebody sent me a news story that rats were eating weed. I don't, I don't think it's food though. I think rats prefer McDonald's. But anyway, I just wanted to give everybody those sort of thoughts about Fanny, share those pictures, get people thinking about what's going on in Cuba. 
What's the tie-in with Tupac? Very, very weird. And yeah, we're gonna, John Cullen won't be with me tonight. He's uh, trying to get over this fever. But uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll see what happens with Fanny. Don't forget to become a sponsor on odyssey.com slash at crowdsource the truth. Crowdsource the truth.substack.com and subscribestar.com and patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth.